Uh, good morning, Bereans. I want to welcome you to Berean Bible Church this morning. Last week, we finished Matthew 24, but we didn't finish the Olivet Discourse. You know, most people think of Matthew 24 like it's just out there by itself and, you know, 25, well, that's something else. No. 25, dealing with the unbroken discourse which Yeshua delivered to His disciples. And this is a bad place for a chapter division. And there's a lot of those things where they just put them in the wrong place. In Matthew 24, 3, in response to Yeshua's prediction about the destruction of the temple, His disciples asked Him a two-part question. They said, tell us, when will this happen? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Because they connected those things. Now, in this parable, so he goes through this teaching, and then as he ends his teaching, he gives three parables to illustrate what he has just taught, and then he wraps it up. All right, so we're going to look at the second parable this morning. And in this parable, he is still answering their questions. And he's saying, you know, again, he's reminding them, you don't know the day or the hour of his return, so you have to watch. You have to pay attention. In chapter 25, verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. The opening word then is important in a twofold way. First, it's a link binding the previous chapter to this one. There is no break in our Lord's discourse as is clear from the comparison. If you look at uh, 2442, he says, Therefore, stay awake. Talking to his disciples. 2444, Therefore, you must also be ready. And then in 2513, Watch therefore, for you don't know. Now, stay awake in 42 and watch in 13 are both Gregorio from the Greek. All right? It means to be vigilant, be on the alert, pay attention, be ready. Both chapters, 24 and 25, emphasize the need of being the bridegroom, who is Yeshua the Christ. The word then also provides the key to the interpretation. When will the kingdom of heaven be like ten bridegrooms? Well, it comes at the of the belong to the same period of time. They speak of that 40-year time of transition and the second coming in AD 70. All three parables speak about an absolute case to deal with those who during his absence were left with certain responsibilities. The parable concerns an absent bridegroom. And it's only incidentally about him. For our Lord Primarily on the waiting for the bridegroom. The wedding parable is about an Eastern wedding. And you understand that Eastern customs are very, very different from those in the West. In an Eastern wedding, the bridegroom is the important figure. Now that's you know that's not true here, okay? It's all about the bride here, right? The guy does just go didn't even know anything was going on, all right? But it's different in, in an Eastern wedding, all right? The bridegroom is the central figure. So our Lord here is spotlighting the experience of ten young virgins who are waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. Their experience is described in these verses. Let's look at him. He said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps, they went to meet the bridegroom, five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. All right, so he starts out by saying, The kingdom of heaven, so he's making a comparison. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Now, there's no difference between those two terms, all right? And what he is doing here, he is comparing the kingdom of God to this wedding. All right, Daniel talks about the kingdom of God, God setting up this kingdom in Daniel 2. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to other people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms. Shall stand forever. So Daniel had foretold of a coming time when the everlasting kingdom would be established. People, Christianity is the kingdom of God. 
kingdom will stand forever. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, quite simply, is the rule, the reign of God. It's not territorial. It's the reign of God. Now he says the kingdom is going to be like. This is the future tense. Looking ahead to the end of the age. Because that's what he's comparing this to. When the bridegroom returns at the end of the age. Alright, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. This means that when the sun returns in judgment, it will be as the case of the ten virgins in the marriage ceremony. So the parable deals with the onset of the consummated kingdom. Now the Lord is still dealing with the disciples' questions about the destruction of the temple, the parousia, the end of the age. We could put it this way. The end of the Jewish age and the consummation of the kingdom of God will be like the coming of the bridegroom to a wedding party. All right? Now, let's talk here about, he says they're, they're like ten virgins. The word virgin here is parthenos. And it's used to describe them. Um, nothing here is, he's not making a big deal about the fact that they're virgins. They're not trying to say they're holy or they're special or something like that. The term would be understand simply to imply that they were young enough not to have been married yet. So, what age do you think that would be? These girls are young, they haven't been married. What age? 15 plus. Okay, good. They would be under the age of puberty. All right? Girls married at puberty. Now, let me show you this in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 16, 7 says, I made you flourish like a plant of the field. God is talking to Israel here. And you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Now, that full adornment is talking about puberty. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. Now, the NIV Cultural Background Study Bible says this, about this verse in Ezekiel. This verse speaks of a young maiden having reached the age of marriageability. Her breasts are formed, her pubic hair is grown. These references should be taken as conventional tokens of marriageability in the ancient Near East. All right? So Ezekiel is describing, he goes on to describe here how God marries Israel because now she has reached a marriageable age. So that's what he's talking about. These, these girls are young girls. They're maybe 12. They're maybe 11. Okay, they're, they're not marriageable age yet. So hopefully it gives you some idea culturally what's going on here. Now he says five of them were foolish and five were wise. So Yeshua makes a distinction here. Some are wise, some are foolish. He's made this distinction earlier in Matthew between the wise and the foolish at the beginning of his teaching in Matthew with reference to the two builders at the end of chapter 7 he talked about the two builders one of them was wise he was building on the rock which was the was obedience to his teaching and then one was foolish they built on the sand the one built on the sand their building was destroyed well the two adjectives used to describe these women are the same ones that he used earlier to describe the two builders and we'll circle around to that when we finish this and talk about that uh, those two builders who built on the rock and on the sand. Now, the wisdom commended here was also the hallmark of the faithful slave in the preceding parable. So the term for foolish here is moras, from which we get our word moron. <laughs> okay? So the, so the Lord is saying some of these girls were morons, all right? <laughs> Some were wise and some were morons. The contrast between the wise and the foolish is a frequent feature of the wisdom literature in the Tanakh, especially in Proverbs. Proverbs makes these comparisons all the time. So we see here that the kingdom of heaven compared to an eastern wedding. Now if we look at this parable with western 21st century eyes, it's going to seem unnatural. It's not going to seem to make any sense to us. But in fact, it really tells a story which could have happened at any time in a Palestinian village and which still happens today in Palestine. All right? The point of the story lies in the Jewish custom, which is very different from anything we know. Marriage ceremonies in the East were conducted with great pomp and solemnity. You know, today you have a wedding, you go to the wedding and the service lasts maybe 20 minutes, then you go to a you know, a reception for a couple hours and that's the end of it. These things lasted for a good long time and there was a lot of people involved. They were a huge occasion. The whole village would turn out to accompany the couple as they went to their new home. And the couple would go by the longest road possible going from the bride's house to the groom's house to gather as many people along as they could as they went. So it became a huge thing. The Jews had a saying, everyone from six 
to 60 will follow the marriage drum. Because as they're going along, they're banging the drum and they're shouting and they're having this good time. And so everybody would just come out and start following it, you know, go to the wedding. Now, here's what really tells you a little, a lot, I think, about what they felt of the weddings. The rabbis agreed. Okay, that's a remarkable statement right there, okay? The rabbis agreed that a man might even abandon the study of the law to share in the joy of the wedding feast. That's the priority they put on it, okay? You could stop studying the Bible and go join this wedding, all right? Now, the details of what are going on here in the wedding are, are vague, and Bible scholars have a lot of different opinions on to exactly the main characters at the wedding are and whether they're going from the bride's house to the groom's house or from the groom's house to the bride's house. You know, where are these attendants? Again, there's different opinions. Kenneth Bailey in his book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, says this, the groom is heading back with the bride to his house. In other words, the grooms come to pick the bride up. You know, they had an engagement period which lasted for a year. You would go, you would say, you know, usually these were arranged marriages. You'd get, okay, here's, she's going to be your bride. Okay, good, thanks, everything's, we work out the contract. The groom leaves, goes back and gets a house ready. All right, so he leaves for probably about a year. Then he comes back and gets her. All right, and then they go to his house, and then they consummate the wedding. All right, the, so Bailey says this, the groom is heading back with the bride to the house where the attendants are waiting for them. The groom is taking the longest route possible through the town to let everyone in town know that they are getting married. Marriages were usually held in the summer, the night, at, at nighttime, once things cooled down a bit. It was the time to be outdoors to have such festivities. Now, the job of these ten girls was to go out and meet the groom as he arrived back to escort him in. That's their whole job, and if they did that job, they came to the wedding feast. Now, Dr. Alexander Finlay says this, this is what he saw himself in Palestine. He says, when we were approaching the gates of a Galilean town, I caught the sight of ten maidens, gaily clad, and playing some kind of musical instrument as they danced along the road in front of our car. When I asked what they were doing, the dragoman told me that they were going to keep the bride company till her bridegroom arrived. Anybody know what a dragoman is? It's a Middle Eastern interpreter and guide, okay? So this, they're guiding, he's, he's explaining this to them. He says, I asked him if there was any chance of seeing the wedding, but he shook his head saying, in effect, it might be tonight or tomorrow night or in a fortnight's time. See, they didn't know the day or the hour when the bridegroom would come, okay? Then he went on to explain that one of the great things to do, if you could, at a middle-class wedding in Palestine was to catch the bridal party napping. So the bridegroom comes unexpectedly and sometimes in the middle of the night. It is true that he is required by public opinion to send a man along the street to shout, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. But that may happen at any time. So the bridal party had to be ready to go out into the street at any time to meet him. Whenever he chooses to come, other important points are that no one is allowed on the streets after dark without a lighted lamp, okay? And also that when the bridegroom has once arrived and the door has been shut, latecomers to the ceremony are not admitted, okay? So, like so many of Yeshua's parables, this one has an immediate and a local meaning. This is the background of the picture that our Lord draws here. Here are ten virgins waiting to join the wedding party. They're expecting the bridegroom, and therefore they are waiting expectantly. Now, is the number ten significant here? Well, I think it just means completeness, total, totality. Seven among the Jews denoted perfection. Ten was also a number of something complete. A company was considered complete if they had ten present. There was an ancient Jewish law that whenever there were ten Jewish men, they could have a synagogue. They couldn't have a synagogue unless they had ten. There were ten witnesses present when Boaz married Ruth. And the company of those who attend as mourners at a funeral was fixed by rabbinical authority. You had to have at least ten mourners. So this number seems to have been thought necessary to form a company. So ten is probably a usual number for such a wedding occasion. Ten, then, is the number of completeness as it's used here. I think this implies the church, all right? There's a completeness to the church, but we'll see more than that here. So who are these virgins? 
Well, in the flow and the purpose of the parable, I think the virgins who are expecting the bridegroom would be the church. The church is waiting for Christ to come. Now, notice how Paul used the analogy of virgins in 2 Corinthians 11:2. 2. He says, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now, so <laughs> the Syrian Orthodox monk, scholar, physician, poet, Ibn al-Tibib of the 11th century in his commentary on this text points out that in the Gospels the church is always feminine. So these virgins are supposed to represent the church. But we need to be careful not to press too much meaning into any of these figures. Many commentators discover the spiritual significance in the virgins as if they denoted some special devotion to Christ. Okay, all oh, they're virgins, they're especially holier. No, that's not the issue here. And that forces an interpretation on the conclusion of the parable. The virgins were the usual companions of the bride and her proper attendance on such an occasion. They are therefore naturally introduced as part of the imagery of the parable. Do you remember what I said last week about parables? What's the number one rule of parabolic interpretation? Don't make a parable, walk on all fours. Bernard Ram in his book, Protestant Biblical Interpretation, puts it this way. He said, the golden rule of parabolic interpretation, now get this because I'm going to be a test a little bit later, I'm going to ask you this, okay? The golden rule of parabolic interpretation is determine the one central truth a parable is teaching. You've got to keep that in mind. Or you get lost in all the details. And so many people take this parable and they're trying to tear everything apart and explain this is that and that is this. And, you know, like he said, don't make a parable walk on all fours. So the objective of the parable, what's it saying? What is the one meaning that we want to get out of this? And if you don't try to pick out every detail of the parable and make them something, I think you can easily understand what the parable is saying here. All right? Preparedness. Watch. Be alert. For the time is coming when getting ready will no longer be possible. He says the door is going to be shut. So the overriding theme of preparedness for the coming of the Son of Man. That's what this parable is about. And it should be clear that it's an amplification of two words which our Lord gave to His disciples after He outlined the course of events. He said to them, be alert. That's what this parable is about. That's what the last parable was about. Be alert. Be ready. Be watching. Some folks try to make each item of the parable mean something symbolic, and they end up with all kinds of strange ideas. One commentator, let me give you a couple just to see how crazy some people get. He claims that the virgins represent Jewish scholars, the lamps represent the Torah, and the oil represents good deeds. The foolish virgins are Jewish scholars who study Torah, but who fail to practice good deeds. They are therefore excluded from the chamber of instruction. The door is shut. The Liberty Commentary says this, The parable of the ten virgins explains the place of Israel's true converts of the tribulation period in relation to the church. The one bride of Christ is the church, John the Baptist is the best man, and the prepared virgins are the saved of the tribulation period. The fact that they all slept implies a period of Jewish inactivity during the church age while the bride is gathered. How in the world do you come up with all this kind of stuff, okay? I mean, it just, you know, okay, they're sleeping because that's the church age and the Jews are just sleeping during that time and later they'll come back into play. That's, you know, classic dispensational theology. Another commentator writes this. That's why this parable is important. It tells us about what it takes to get to heaven. How that came into play, I, I, I have no clue. I'm like, what? The Lord's talking to His disciples. They're His disciples, and He's telling them, you've got to be ready, and they're saying, this tells you how to get to heaven. If this tells you how to get to heaven, then it's salvation by works. Okay? Now, as in the previous parable, all the household which was waiting for the absent Lord, this parable is obviously intended to describe those who lived between the Lord's ascension and His second coming. See, the Lord knew at this time that He was going to go away. He's getting ready to leave. He knew there's going to be this intervening, intervening period of time before His return. And He wants them to be ready during that time. He wants them to be alert. He wants them to pay attention to what He's taught them because He's coming again and He wants them to be ready for that. 
The parable stresses the need for preparedness in the face of unexpected delay. Now, last week we saw that the first parable indicates that watching involves understanding and obeying the Word of God. If you don't know what the Word of God teaches, you can't watch, you can't be prepared. And they needed to understand the Christian doctrine so that they wouldn't turn back to Judaism. That was the problem they were facing. The longer the Lord delayed, the more difficult it became for them. They were being persecuted by the Jews, and many of them were just turning back. Here is the story about ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom's coming. And certain clues are given to us as to reveal the meaning that our Lord is after. Notice, first of all, that there's a vision among the ten. Five are foolish, five are wise. They fall into two groups, right? The first question, therefore, that immediately confronts us, what makes the difference? Why were five wise? Why were five foolish? In what way are five wise? In what way are others foolish? You can immediately see there were certain very similar things about all ten of them. All of them intended to meet the bridegroom and escort him back to the place where the festivities were held. That's what they're all there for, right? They all had lamps. So it's not the ground of division there. They also all had oil when it started. So that's not that. Further, they're all expecting the bridegroom is coming. They all had a sense of anticipation. Also, when he was delayed, they all slept. And the bridegroom was delayed. They all became drowsy and slept. So in each of these parables, the Lord clearly indicates that there's going to be what seemed to be for them a long delay for the parousia. Now remember, the Lord is speaking this. He's still on earth. He hasn't been crucified yet, so He hasn't been ascended yet. After the ascension, we got 40 years until He returns. So do 40 years seem like a long time for you? Uh, it seems like a very long time to me because I don't think I'll see it, okay? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even want to live that long, okay? Another 40 years. So, you know, I don't, you know. But anybody, you think 40 years, that's a long time, all right? He says, but if the wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, 2519, now after a long time. So it just seems like, okay, he's going away and 40 years is a long time. But commenting on the long delay, Stephen F. Hayhow writes this, Both parables, the parable of the virgins, the parable of the talents, speak of the absence of the bridegroom master, who is said to be a long time in coming. And after a long time, the master of the servants returned. This suggests not the events of AD 70, which were to occur in the near future. How is 40 years a near future? In fact, within the space of a generation. Yeah, 40, that's a 40-year time period. Okay? But a distant event, the return of Christ. So he's saying that the delay that they're talking about here is a long, long delay, 2,000 years. We need to understand this delay in the light of what Scripture says about the second coming. Scripture indicates that he was going to come back within a 40-year period. We looked at that. The early Christians expect him to return within their lifetime because he said he would. From the time Yeshua spoke these parables until he returned in AD 70, it was a little over 40 years. Now let me ask you a question. Would you like to wait 40 years for something? That's self. That seems like a long time. Yeah, so there's a delay there, right? To those waiting for his return, 40 years must have seemed like that's a long time. One expositor writes, but Jesus did not teach a soon return at all. He clearly indicated, not only by implication and indirect statement as this parable, but also very specifically that it would be a long time before his return. The bridegroom would be delayed in the previous parable of the household. There is the same thing. The servant says to himself, my Lord delays his coming. Also in the following parable, we find it even clearer. After a long time, the master comes to demand an accounting from his servants. Jesus clearly taught it would be a long time before his return to earth again. Well, it would be a long time for them, who, the people he was talking to. And so this guy's saying, Jesus didn't teach a soon return at all. Now, I guess you'd have to define soon, okay? Because he did teach a soon return, but what did he mean by that? All right, he's correct if he meant that Jesus didn't say, I'll be back next year, I'll be back in two years, I'll be back in ten years. But he clearly taught he would come in the lifetime of the people to whom he spoke. 
Matthew 10, 23. When they persecute you, talking to his disciples, they're going to persecute you in one town, go to the next town. That makes sense, doesn't it? Just leave, go, move on. That's not, wouldn't be so easy for us, but for them it was a little bit easier. All right, go to the next town. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. You won't even go through all of them. I'll be back. Don't worry. He's telling them that. Now those of us who take the Bible seriously need to take Yeshua at His word. The cities He referred to here are long buried under centuries of dirt. Okay, they're gone. So we need to conclude that sometime in the first century, this prophecy was fulfilled. Yeshua also said, truly I say to you, again his disciples, there are some standing here, some of you disciples, who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Again, he's talking to them, you guys, some of you are going to be alive when I come back. Yep, some of them will make it 40 years. Okay? If someone standing there was to see his coming, he must have come in their lifetime. Yeshua told them he would return in that generation. 24, 34, truly I say to you, again, his disciples, this generation will not pass away. And again, we talked about this. A generation is 40 years. That's, that's a long time to wait. He says, so he knew they would be in that generation, but they didn't know the day or the hour. They didn't know exactly when. So this delay has to be looked at in light of the Scripture. There was a delay. I certainly would consider 40 years of delay. All right? Gary DeMar has this excellent comment on the delay here. He says, The parables of Matthew 24 and 25 are clear on the duration of delays. The two masters who go on a journey return to the same people they left. Exactly. There is no need to allegorize these parables to force them to depict a distant coming of Christ. In addition, the delay of the bridegroom in these parables of the ten virgins is not very long unless the virgins are related to Rip Van Winkle. Okay? <laughs> The virgins get drowsy at dusk, and the bridegroom returns at midnight. How can this delay be turned into a span of time nearly 2,000 years in length? It can't be. So while they're waiting for the bridegroom, the ten virgins fall asleep. Here again. <laughs> Some who read this parable misinterpret it and say, this is wrong. These virgins should never have fell asleep. There's nothing in the story to indicate that anything was wrong with them falling asleep. They all fell asleep. It was a perfectly natural thing for them to do. After all, it's nighttime. It's a big festival thing, so they're not working. And these girls are very young girls. They're tired. They went to sleep. They're waiting for the bridegroom. They got tired of waiting. So they just took a nap. All right? It was natural for them to catch a few wings. Our Lord never indicates any blame toward these virgins because they slept. The foolish slept, the wise slept. So we've got to be careful in interpreting these stories, not to try to read into them things that are not implied. It's perhaps suggestive that our Lord records that they all slept. That indicates that when He said, be alert, He was clearly not meaning stare out the window the whole time. No, just be ready, be prepared, be ready for the return. He says in verse 6, But at midnight there was a cry. Here's the bridegroom, come meet him. That's normal in the weddings. That happens in the wedding. Now the same words here for cry and meet are used by Paul in describing the coming of Christ in 1 Thessalonians. And he also says that it's going to be like a thief in the night. So this, these are connected. But now, according to the story, at midnight came a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And that plunges into the rest of the story. that says, Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. They all get up, they're getting ready. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since it will not be enough for us and you, you go to the dealer by yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open up. And he answered them, Truly I say to you, I do not know you, Watch, therefore, you do not know neither the day or the hour. Now, they rose and they trimmed their lamps. What is this lamp here? Well, the English translation, they translate it lamp. The Greek word is lampos. 
It can be translated lamp, light. Some say this is more like a torch. They say it's formed by a bundle of sticks, which is then dipped in oil, rather than the pottery lamps with the wick on them. Those would be called luknas, all right, the little pottery lamp with the wick. These are more like torches that the arresting party carried in John 18.3, all right? Unlike lamps, which have a reservoir and can burn for some time, torches go out quickly. They need to constantly be dipped in the oil to maintain their light. So some say that's what they're talking about. I'm not too sure of that. I think um, uh, John Gill has a better idea here. But first, R.T. French said this. He said, a torch without a jar of oil was as useless as a modern flashlight without a battery. Makes sense, right? That's the energy to keep it going. All right, the, the 18th century Bible commentator John Gill cited the Jewish Mishnah describing the kind of lamp or torch as a torch was an earthen vessel in the form of a reed, at the top of which was a proper receptacle in which they burnt old rags dipped in oil. Now, if this is the case, what they're describing here is a modern day tiki torch. Okay? You got that pole, you got that thing, and on top there's a little reservoir and a wick and stuff, and so that's, that's what Gil thinks they're talking about here. They weren't allowed to go out at night without a light, uh, and the light wasn't really to see what's out there. The light would hold in front of their face so they could, people could see who they were, all right? So it's immediately evident from this that the critical difference between the wise and the foolish is the fact that the wise had extra oil, Okay? Give us some of your oil, they say. I didn't ask very nice to start with, okay? They're just kind of demanding it. They all had oil to begin with, but the wise took along an extra supply, and that's what made it possible for them to endure the unexpected delay of the bridegroom. Now, let me ask you this. What does the oil symbolize? Okay, after what we've talked about parabolic interpretation... What does the oil symbolize? Your response should be, who cares? <laughs> who cares? It doesn't matter what, it, it's oil. It's part of the story, okay? It doesn't have to be something. A big deal is made out of the oil because they think it divides the virgins. I think they're wrong. They all had oil. Some just didn't have enough. Let's look at what they say about the oil. Cook writes this. The flame of the lamp is outward and visible. The oil which feeds is inward and invisible. The foolish virgins had an outward show of religion, but were deficient in the inward source from which the religion springs and by which it's maintained. What in the world? Come on. The majority of commentaries take oil to be a symbol for the Holy Spirit. And they believe that the wise having oil represented these are the truly regenerate. But people, they both had oil to begin with. The wise and the foolish. The foolish ran out. So how can it refer to the Holy Spirit? Do we run out of the Holy Spirit? Do you all have a extra jar, a little supply? You know, you get low, you dump a little more in there? No, that's ridiculous. Again, if you neglect the main rule of parabolic interpretation, you end up with all kinds of crazy things. The theme of this parable turns on the bridegroom's delay. The foolish virgins forgot to bring the oil, but the delay of the bridegroom shows they didn't bring enough. They didn't bring enough to carry them through. The oil can't be forced to mean good works of the Holy Spirit. It's merely part of the story. They weren't prepared for the delay. It's preparedness that distinguishes the wise from the foolish virgins. The wise were prepared to last through the delay. The five virgins, the foolish virgins, probably expected the bridegroom was going to come a lot sooner. Therefore, they didn't make provisions for the delay. Where the wise virgins said, we don't really know, let's take a little extra. Now, without a light, these maidens could not get into the marriage feast. Our Lord doesn't say why. We don't really know why. But it's obviously clear that without the light, you don't get in, okay? And their light went out, so they had to go try to find some more oil. Verse 10 says, And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with them, the marriage feast, and the door was shut. So there were some who were ready, and that's what he was telling them. Be ready, be prepared. So cycling back to the main point of the parable, remember the word ready found in this verse was also used by Yeshua back in Matthew 24, 44, where he said, therefore you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is going to come in an hour you don't expect. When the bridegroom came, only those who were ready went in. 
The word ready here is hetemos in the Greek, and it means prepared. Again, the same idea seen here. They were not ready. They were unprepared. So they didn't get in. Watch, therefore. He gives them the parable. These girls weren't ready. So watch, therefore, because you don't know the day or the hour. The Greek here for watch is, again, gregorio, and it means to keep awake, to watch, literally or figuratively, be vigilant. It's the same word that he used in Matthew 24, 42 through 43. Therefore, stay awake. Why? Because you don't know the day the Lord is coming. It should be clear that the idea of this parable is the same as we saw in the previous parable. Not to watch would cost these first century saints dearly. It could cost them their lives. Because if they weren't watching, they weren't paying attention to doctrine, they were going to get caught up in the Jewish stuff and get, end up being killed in the destruction of Jerusalem. Look what Luke says. Luke 26, uh, 17, 26, 33. Just as it was in the day of Noah, that's judgment, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They're eating and drinking, they're marrying, being given in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. So, picture of judgment. All right? Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they're eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rain from heaven and destroyed them all, so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Again, another picture of judgment. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. If you're up there, get out of there, okay? This is what he's telling you. Get out of Jerusalem. And likewise, let the one who's in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. She turned back. What happened to her? She was judged. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. It's going to be so counterintuitive to them because Jerusalem is a fortress. Huge, thick walls, big fortress. That's the place you want to go if an enemy is coming at you. Unless the Lord says don't. Okay, so it is counterintuitive. You're in the field, you see the army, let me head to the fort. He said, don't do it, that fort's going down. They needed to be prepared to flee Jerusalem in light of His coming. This is the scope or design of the whole parable. We also see here the idea, they don't know the day or the hour. He says, you got to watch because you don't know. You know it's a generation. You know it's 40 years, but you don't know a day or the hour. Therefore, you got to always be watching. Now notice here that the bridegroom is identified by Luke as the Son of Man. Like the coming of the bridegroom, His advent will be sudden and costly to those who are not prepared. Now, notice here that the marriage of Christ, the bridegroom in verse 10, occurs in connection with his parousia in verse 13. Now, unless Christ is involved in more than one marriage, his marriage in Revelation 19 is also connected with the fall of Babylon, the city where Christ was crucified. Hence, the destruction of Jerusalem is the time frame of the parousia and therefore the time frame of the marriage. Now, the warning of the parable is not to be confused by seeking these spiritual meanings. The oil, the sheep, the vessels, the lamp, all this stuff. The parable's burden is that you got to be ready for the bridegroom's coming. The parable is not addressed to those who have made no preparations for the Lord's coming, but to those who have made, in, made insufficient preparation. Why were these virgins foolish? What was it that made them foolish? They were foolish in that they had not prepared. In other words, they were unprepared instead of remaining faithful to the apostles' doctrine. And we talked about this last week. They, turn, they were turning back because they weren't prepared, they weren't understanding the doctrine, and they went back to the system of Judaism. Last week we saw that watching had to do with understanding and following sound doctrine. Near the end of the transition period, many turned away from the faith because of persecution and went back under the law. The persecution and trials caused them to fall away. They turned back to the Jewish system and thus they were destroyed in the Jewish war. The door was shut. If they didn't flee Jerusalem quickly, they lost all opportunity to escape. The door was shut and they suffered and died in that collapse. Now the word used in Matthew 25 for foolish, we said is the Greek word moros. It means dull or stupid. That same word is used in Titus 3, 9 through 11, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. What is being referred to here is the teaching of the circumcision party. 
These Judaizers were constantly on the Christians to keep the Jewish law. The conflict that raged in the New Testament times is to be understood in terms of two covenants. Outwardly, the old covenant order remained intact. The temple was still there. They're still offering sacrifices. They're still going through all the rituals. And Jewish Christianity as a whole was blinded to the age-changing significance of Christ's death and resurrection. And Paul dealt much with this subject in the book of Galatians. The Galatians were acting foolishly and that they're turning back to the law. He says in Galatians 3, 1 through 3, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Yeshua the Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or the hearing of faith? Are you so moronic? Having begun in the Spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh? Here, flesh and Spirit stand for the two modes of existence as determined by the two covenants. Paul's question is, does it take the old age of the flesh to make you perfect, complete in the new age of the Spirit? Where the promise is being fulfilled, the question, are you now being made perfect in the flesh, is asking if they are made perfect by the ceremonial works of the law and not the gospel. They had begun in the Spirit. They were Christians, but now they were turning back to the law, which was foolish and would cause them not to be watchful. This is the emphasis of the book of Hebrews also. If they turn back to Judaism, they would be destroyed in its destruction. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after having received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. I think he's talking about the destruction there. You're going back to that system. You're going to be destroyed in Jerusalem when it's destroyed. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? He's been sanctified. He's defining, defiling that and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. All right. His children. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I think this is speaking of the believer who was sanctified, verse 29, but they're turning away from the gospel. They're going back to Jerusalem because the persecution is too much. They haven't been watching. They are not ready in the sense of understanding the doctrine and what Christ was teaching. Hebrews 10.35 says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. Don't give up, people. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now the Greek here is very expressive and emphatic. The author used a word which signifies a little while. Then he adds for further emphasis a particle meaning very. And to this he further intensifies it by repeating it. Thus literally rendered, this clause reads this way, For yet a very, very little while, and he that shall come will come. Because this is near the end of the 40 years. There's only a few years left. And he's saying, in a very little while. And you see the intensity approach as we get near the end of that 40 years. He's going to come. He's coming in a very little while. And you need to be living by faith. You need to be watching. Because if you draw back, you will be destroyed at his coming. So Yeshua told His disciples, He's going to come in their lifetime. They didn't know the day or the hour. So they were to be watching. Again, we talked about this in relation to a pregnancy. A pregnancy is 40 weeks, all right? We know it's going to have, that baby's coming in about 40 weeks. Do we know the day or the hour? Not unless you schedule a C-section. You don't know, okay? And that's, talk, that's what it's talking about. Same thing. They knew about the time period. Didn't know exactly when. Those who were wise would be prepared for His coming. And they would thus escape the destruction of the city thus rejoicing that His judgment had come on the old covenant world. If they were foolish and not watching, He's going to come unexpectedly and they're going to suffer great pain as that city is destroyed. So being foolish would cost them their lives. This parable was given to first century saints, people. 
They were watching and ready for His coming. Its application to us is found only in the universal principle that those believers who know and obey the Word of God are blessed. Those who believe and are not obedient to the principles of the Word of God are going to be disciplined. That's what happened to them. They didn't obey. They weren't watching. They weren't ready. That applies to us today, I think. If you're not watching, if you're not ready, if you're not living in a holy, righteous life, you're going to be judged. You're going to be disciplined. We're not to watch for His coming. But we are to live by the Word of God. And when we fail to do this, it will cost us. Yeshua concluded His Sermon on the Mount like this. And like I said, this text in Matthew uses these same words for foolish and wise. All right? He says, Everyone then who hears these words of Mine. He's given them this message, the Sermon on the Mount. He's given them the sermon. If you hear these words and do them, will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. So you're obedient, you're wise, you're on a rock. Good place to be, right? And watch what he says. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. People, when we live in obedience to the Word of God, we build a rock foundation. But he goes on to say, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. They don't obey. They're foolish. They're building on sand. And the rain fell. The floods came. The winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. The issue here, people, is obedience. Obedience to Yeshua's teaching. See, when you build your house on a rock, when you live in obedience to the teaching of the Word of God, the storms of life can beat against you all they want, and it's not going to affect you. Look at the Apostle Paul. He founded his life on a rock, and no matter what they did to him, he was smiling and happy and, you know, hey, put, beat him and put him in a dungeon, and he says, let's sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's maybe he's saying that. Huh? He was unaffected because his life was built on the rock. The storms of life won't destroy that. But when you build on the sand, you're not obedient to the teaching of the Word of God. Life storms come, they're going to destroy you. So the question today is, where are you building your house? Living in obedience to the teaching of Christ will be a great blessing to us. We'll be like these wise virgins, okay? We'll be ready. We'll be prepared. Not for the Lord's coming, but prepared for life. But building on the sand is foolish, and your life will be destroyed because of that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this parable and for our Lord's words to his disciples to be ready. Be prepared. Don't turn back to Judaism. His coming was sure, but to them it must have seemed like a long delay, and many of them grew weary. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word of God. I pray you'd give us the heart of Bereans, that we would search the Scripture, Lord, to see if these things are so. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. Amen. Okay, questions? Sharon. First of all, thank you. What? Say. Come on. Uh, yeah, I, just I can't believe that shit. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I, I have a question about the very end when he says, you know, depart from me, I never knew you, because we're assuming they're all believers, they right. just fell away. So is that just one of those all fours things? Or does yeah, I think that's one of those things that is just connected with the parable, because if, they, if the bridesmaids didn't have the lights, they didn't get into the wedding ceremony. And I think he's just corresponding it with that, okay? So is that maybe corresponding then to Jerusalem? Because if they're saved, they, the door's not shut to them, but the doors were shut in Jerusalem. Right, so that, yes. The, the, the door being shut there, I think, is the door of judgment because they weren't ready. Okay. Okay. So it was a temporal thing. Yes. But, okay. Right. Because he's dealing with Christians here, all right? He's, telling Chris, he's not telling unbelievers how to be ready for his coming. They don't care about His coming. They don't care about Him. He's talking to His people about being ready for His coming. Some of His people were ready. Some of them weren't. All right? Most of the Christians, when they saw the opportunity, they left Jerusalem and they fled to Pella. They left town. Some did not. Okay? 
I mean, it's, again, this is a huge contradiction. You're going to trust the Lord and do what He says against everything you know and go out there when the Roman army's out there killing people, cutting them up, or are you going to stay in the fortress? Those who trusted Christ fled and saved their lives. You know, one thing I don't think you ever mentioned or anyone ever mentioned is that Jerusalem is a fortress, but they didn't really have an army in there. They couldn't necessarily defend themselves that well from the Roman army. Well, they had plenty of armed people in there, but what the, the, the sad thing was what happened is they started killing each other inside right. Jerusalem. Okay, they turned on each other. They were literally killing each other and fighting inside, so it was just like they, they were no match for, you know, once Rome broke in, they were done, you know. Also, but they could have defended that fort. Themselves. They could have, you know. Any other questions, comments? I think about Second Peter and people complaining. Where's the promise of his coming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all, it's been a long time. What, well, and see, I think we can understand that if we put ourselves in their shoe. I mean, Lord, you, you promised you were going to come. It's been 30 some years. I'm like, I'm tired of waiting, you know? We're just, just hang on. It's only 19,000 years. That's right. A lot of us are tired of waiting, too. We're waiting for arrests to happen in this country that haven't happened. And we're like, where? Come on, what's going on here? I want to see some arrests. I want to see some of these people locked up. I'm tired of waiting. But. We got to wait a little longer. David? Plus, it's so easy, even while you were going through that, a lot of questions were going through in my mind about kind of like what Sharon addressed, but it's so easy for us from Matthew 24 1 to 25 1 to forget the context is the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, just that quick. And that's it. And that's the whole thing. That's why, and again, with parable, you know, I know every detail is like, okay, what? No, don't pull it all out. You know? That's why I said, what's the oil represent? Represent oil. Okay, <laughs> don't make it so, you know, it's so funny how people make it so many things. I mean, you know, especially if you're a commentator, you should know the rules of interpreting parables. We interpret, we interpret all literature differently, whether it's apocalyptic, you know, didactic, parabolic. We've got to figure out what we're dealing with so we know how to interpret. If we don't do that, we just come up with all kinds of crazy. They ran out of the Holy Spirit. Should have brought more. <laughs>